Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, my colleagues in the US. Uh, I welcome you to our webinar regarding the business opportunities in the United States under the stimulus packages that uh, are in place for already some times. Uh, so this is nothing new, but this is something that we would like to update you and motivate to still uh, take it into consideration when you're planning your business in the United States. Uh, just a technical, uh, two technical uh, points. First of all, this session will be recorded. So if you are not, if you do not agree with uh, this being recorded, uh, I will kindly ask you to leave. Uh, the recording will uh, be stopped at the uh, presentation of, of UBS for some technical and uh, compliance reasons, uh, but the uh, the whole recordings and all presentation will be sent to you afterwards. So, just a few Okay. So my name is Arthur Czerniewski. I'm heading the Swiss Business Hub in the USA. And uh, I have a pleasure to guide you through the today's uh, session. As uh, for the timeline, uh, we will start with the short introduction. Uh, first from myself, then uh, my colleague Roger Sonderegger from Swiss Mem. We will also say a few words as they are Swiss Mem is co-organizing this webinar. And then we will start with the main presentation. Uh, regarding our topics from uh, Candice Long, uh, followed by the presentation of uh, UBS about the support, how the UBS can support the Swiss companies in the US market. We end up the seminar, the webinar with the Q&A uh, questions where you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Please use the chat function of this uh, webinar to ask your questions, then I will read them and uh, direct to the respective uh, speaker. Switzerland Global Enterprise, uh, for those who don't know us, uh, we support the Swiss uh, small and medium sized companies, in their international business, but also foreign uh, innovative foreign companies to establish in Switzerland. For the numbers, you can see that we have uh, we are a private non-profit uh, association with uh, almost 6,000 customers. We are growing every year, so plus 3% uh, from last year. And we have uh, more than 2,100 members. This is important that you don't have to be a member of our organization to profit from our services. The headquarter of Switzerland Global Enterprise is in uh, Zurich. We have two regional offices in uh, Renault and Lugano, and all together a little bit more than 100 employees in, in Switzerland. The global presence, and these are the Swiss business hubs. Uh, we are so-called uh, global network of Switzerland Global Enterprise based in uh, more than 30 countries. Uh, however, together with our partners, we support uh, Swiss companies uh, over uh, 130 different countries. Regarding our budget, it's about 40 million. Therefore, 72-75% I publicly funded. And our four main mandates, it's export promotion, the biggest one, which we actually have for last almost 100 years. So we'll have a jubileum. Uh, soon, and we do it uh, in uh, on the mandate is from the State Secretary of uh, for Economic Affairs, SECO. The second biggest mandate is the invest promotion, so bringing the foreign companies to Switzerland, uh, which we do on behalf of SECO and the Swiss cantons. This is a little bit uh, newer mandate since 2008. Then we have uh, a mandate for big infrastructure projects. This is also on behalf of SECO, but in cooperation with uh, Swiss Export uh, Risk Insurance, SERF. 
and the clean tech, uh, which we do also on behalf of SECO and Switzerland, Swiss Federal Office of Energy. Regarding my team in the US, we opened the Swiss Business Hub, which was the first Swiss Business Hub worldwide in 2000. And we offer the full uh, SG portfolio, which means we offer export and investment promotion. If you look at the export promotion, what we do, uh, we do quite a lot of uh, trade shows, trade shows where we have uh, Swiss pavilions. Uh, if you know the big exhibition like CES or MDM West or Bio International, that's where we had already the Swiss Pavilion this year. We organize the webinars. This is a good example of what we do. But we also organize the business missions or partner search or location search. So all the services that you would like uh, to take uh, into consideration, we are ready for you to do it. I have a team of uh, dedicated uh, 13 people. Uh, the headquarter is in New York City. Uh, we have uh, also our team members in uh, other locations of the Swiss representations. So in, in Boston, in Washington, in Atlanta, in San Francisco and Los Angeles. We are the biggest hub because the US is the biggest market for Switzerland. Um, we have um, we consult roughly 500 companies yearly and we also on the invest side we facilitate up between 15 and 20 settlements of few US companies in Switzerland. Uh, we are member of Team Switzerland. Team Switzerland is composed by Switzerland Global Enterprise, uh, Chamber of Commerce, associations, uh, other uh, federal uh, offices. So we are all together working on one uh, on one target to facilitate the business of the Swiss companies and to increase our presence abroad. We have a long-standing cooperation with Swiss STEM, our partner in this webinar today. Um, I just came from the big exhibition in Chicago, INTS, where we also work with the Swiss MEM uh, together and this cooperation uh, is running very smoothly. Also, our speakers today from KPMG and UBS, uh, we partner with them on the various events. So I'm very happy that uh, both representatives of this organization were ready and uh, to, to present and to share the knowledge with all of you. That's all from my side. Now I would like to introduce Roger Sonderecker the head of the department, new energy systems at the Swiss Man. Roger, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Arthur. Also, thanks uh, to SGE for organizing this uh, webinar about the US market uh, today. I also like to welcome everybody in this uh, online meeting, and I'm looking forward to an interesting uh, discussion. As an introduction, I would uh, like to show a number of slides about SwissMem and also about Team Switzerland. So I'm just trying to move on one slide. Yep, maybe um, Sabine, can you help and move on and jump to the next slide? Thank you. So SwissMem is the traditional association of the mechanical, ele electrical, engineering and metal industry in Switzerland. The headquarters are in Zurich. Uh, we also have um, offices in Winterthur, Bern and, and uh, Lausanne. It's about 1,400 member companies who joined uh, SwissMem. Of course, there are the big ones like ABB, Siemens, Bühler, Schindler but around 90% of the companies are small and medium enterprise uh, companies. If we look at the key figures of the tech industry or of the MEM industry, you see that the total turnover is about 90 billion Swiss francs. 
The export is about 70 billion Swiss francs. This means an export share of 80%. It's about 7% of the gross domestic product of Switzerland. We have 330,000 people working in this uh, industry sector and about 20,000 apprenticeships. It may be interesting to see um, the e exports of Switzerland. You see that the technology industry or tech industry, it's about 26%. Then the biggest portion in Switzerland is the pharmaceutical area with 38, chemical 11, and watches 10%. If uh, we look at the export statistics to the single markets, you see on the left side that still the biggest single market is Germany with 23.5%, uh, followed by the USA, which was increasing over the last years significantly, then followed by other countries, China, France and the European markets. If you look at these um, <coughs> blue um, Blue areas, you see that the, the decrease in the first uh, six months in the year uh, versus Germany was uh, really above the average. So the average was minus four, but Germany was going down minus eight, whereas USA increased by 2% and China even by plus 6%. Um, I will not go into more details. We will send you the slides anyway. So I jump to the next one. In SwissMem, it's about uh, 700 companies who are part of these industrial sectors. And at the start of the year, for example, the group Environmental Technology or New Energy Systems or also Pump Technology, they have seen that there may be uh, opportunities in the US market. And therefore, we were reaching out to the, to the Swiss Business Hub uh, to ask whether there is a possibility to organize such a webinar what we are doing just today. So thanks again for organizing this. I like to finish with a few comments about the team uh, Switzerland. As Arthur mentioned, there is a mandate given from the government to SECO to um, SGE about big infrastructure projects. And if you look at all these um, institutions below in the gray area. You see in this Team Switzerland, it's consisting of Swiss MEM, Swiss Rail, SURF, SGE and SECO. And they are regularly uh, meeting and also screening where there are big infrastructure projects around the world. The fact is that in many areas, um, uh, Swiss suppliers, they supply components or sub-projects, uh, sub, uh, subsystems. And in many cases, there are these so-called EPCs leading the complete project, and therefore it's important to identify them, follow up, find a project uh, a timeline, and then also find a way how to work together with them. And when the team was looking at the key points, it's mainly two focus areas. One is the, the focus on the, uh, the next slide, please. There is a mandate if we look at the areas of application. So um, for Swiss companies, we see huge uh, opportunities in these five areas. So mobility, energy, environmental, commercial infrastructure and natural disasters. And on the other side, we see also geographical focus. And this was then defined also in this uh, Team Switzerland that US, Brazil, South Africa, UEA, uh, India, Indonesia, and in the future also Ukraine will be focus areas of this uh, approach, which is done of Team Switzerland. So with this slide, I like to finish and uh, give back to Arthur. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roger. <coughs> Now I would like to welcome Candice Long, Managing Tax Director, Global Credits, Grants and Incentives, and also North America Regional Hub Leader from the company KPMG LLP. So Candice, the floor is yours. 
Yes, thank you, Archer. So my name is Candace Long, and I'm very happy to be with you here today. We're going to talk through some of the major infrastructure and investment spending packages that have passed here in the U.S. within the last few years. It's been quite historic, uh, you know, once in a generation sort of spending in the bills. And so if we go to the next slide here, I will summarize just a few of those key packages. So the first one being the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And so this was actually the first of the big three. Uh, there's three main packages that have been passed within, it was the span of one year from 2021 to 2022 that made one and a half trillion dollars available in terms of funding. That could be grants, incentives, tax credits, low interest loans, what have you. And starting with the infrastructure bill, you know, this is a bill to rejuvenate the, the infrastructure here in the U.S. So we're talking about rail, airway, uh, broadband, including clean energy as well. And so it certainly is a historic size package that maybe has a little bit of a more specific applicability to, to organizations that help to build those sort of projects. And so I won't spend as much time on that bill. I will definitely spend a lot more time on the IRA or Inflation Reduction Act. And so the Inflation Reduction Act was passed about a little less than a year later, and that really helped to revolutionize or at least set the stage for the clean energy and renewable energy transition here in the U.S. And not only the uptake of that ener the renewable energy, but also the build out, the domestic supply chain and building out the, the components that are needed for all of those applications. And so certainly the IRA, which I'll, I'll refer to it as shorthand, has provided and is likely the most applicable to the audience here today. And this is just due to some of the mechanisms that were made available within the bill. And so again, there's a, you know grants, tax credits, and, um, and loans that are included within this bill. And then lastly, I'll just give a quick little mention to the CHIPS bill. So CHIPS was also passed in the U.S. in 2022, and that certainly made a lot of money available for semiconductor R&D and manufacturing in the U.S. And so, it, again, it's, it's grant-oriented as well as tax credit-oriented. There is a tax credit that's available for making investments in advanced manufacturing facilities and and again, that applicability is a somewhat narrow, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. But you can see that really these three bills are setting the stage for, for not only, you know, hauling or, um, you know, getting the infrastructure um, refreshed here in the U.S., but also just building out the clean energy transition, including the semiconductors and chips that go into some of those applications. And so I like I said, I'm going to focus on the IRA or Inflation Reduction Act because it has certainly the broadest applicability to a number of different organizations. You know, obviously we're talking about clean energy and even if your organization is not responsible for for partaking or generating activities that would lead to a tax credit, your organization could still get involved and perhaps buying some tax credits from other organizations that actually generate these activities. And so that is really how, you know, this opens it up to, you know, anybody who has a tax liability on a federal income tax basis here in the U.S. to partake in this. And so we talk about the IRA. Certainly it's, you know, ex significantly extended as well as enhanced number of existing energy credits. So there were energy credits previous to the IRA, but the IRA just supercharged them and made them much more plentiful. There's a number of new credits added for new technologies like hydrogen and nuclear and battery storage, among many others. Now, if we think about some of these tax credits that are in play here, the range of benefits can wildly vary depending on the sort of requirements that are met as part of these projects. And so I'm going to hit on some of these major themes of uh, requirements that generally would need to be met in order to maximize the full tax credit rate that could be available. And then lastly, as I mentioned, these tax credits, many of them were made transferable 
And some of them were actually made refundable. And so this is definitely a game changer here in the U.S. To have transferable federal tax credits, that has never before been a thing. So prior to the IRA, that was not a thing, although there certainly were state credits that were transferable that were previously available, perhaps not related to clean energy. But what this means is that, you know, somebody who perhaps generates a tax credit but can't use it because they don't have tax liability, they could sell it to a third party for cash at a discount and receive that, that cash. And then the other party could take that tax credit on their return. And then, as I mentioned, a few of the credits are refundable. It's referred to as elective pay or direct pay. And so even if there was no federal income tax liability owed, you might still be able to receive a cash check from the government if you generated a tax credit that was available for refundability. So if we think about the tax credits that were passed, I'm just going to do a broad brush here, you know, starting with renewable energy. And so, of course, when we're thinking about our solar, wind, geothermal, combined heat and power, waste heat recovery, you know, these are all examples of renewable energy technologies that may be available for two, one of two different types of tax credits. So you have to pick either the investment tax credit or the production tax credit. And so you pick one or the other with the investment tax credit being the credit that would be available for the capital expenditures that your organization would spend to install and place into service, let's say solar, solar panels or wind towers or what have you. There's also a production tax credit available. So you'd have to pick, like I said, one or the other. Investment tax credit is based on when you place the asset into service. So you have to spend the money first, place the asset into service, and then you can go about claiming that tax credit in your uh, the return for your organization. The production tax credit is really an annual credit. It's 10 years as opposed to investment tax credit, which is only a one-year credit. The 10-year production tax credit is based on the amount of renewable energy that is produced within a given year. And there are certain rates that are allotted for, for each of the technologies. And so again, if these technologies, if you all are investing in these, it certainly would be prudent to understand which of them in terms of a modeling scenario would produce the optimal benefit. Besides that, you, there are other benefits available as well. So advanced manufacturing, really this is the whole bucket around developing the domestic supply chain here in the US to manufacture and produce the components that go into those renewable energy applications. And so new credits are made available in that arena. Again, they're more capital expenditure based. But, well, I should say one of them is more capital expenditure based, again, based on when you base place the asset into service, whereas there's a brand new credit made called the Advanced Manufacturing Production Credit. And that is, again, a production rate that's based on the type of component that's produced and a certain rate that's prescribed to that component. That is one of the credits that's actually refundable. And so, like I said, a few of the credits are refundable. This is one of them. Many of these credits that I'm talking about right now, most of them are transferable. Certainly, when we're talking about transportation, there has been encouragement in this space around clean vehicles, so investing or purchasing clean vehicles, as well as the charging stations to charge those vehicles. And then uh, there's also a, a few other credits related to the development of alternative fuel, sustainable aviation fuel, and then what I like to refer to as the molecular credits. So if you all are involved in uh, credits, or I should say uh, carbon oxide sequestration, or storage or use, or the production of hydrogen, those two are also areas that now have credits. The, the carbon sequestration credit has been around for a while, although it was enhanced as part of the IRA. Both of these two credits are also refundable as well and transferable. So this should give you a stage of some of the broad brush strokes of the incentives that are available that either your organization might be generating or you might decide your organization wants to buy a tax credit from somebody else who generates this sort of activity. Now, when we talk about the investment tax credit, so we'll go into an, a little bit more detail here, because like I said, the benefit really is 
broadly ranges and it really depends on the sort of requirements that are met as part of that project. Investment tax credit, the, the computation itself is somewhat basic, but I will say that each of the components that goes into that calculation would require obviously some, uh, some legwork to pull together. And so certainly looking at the eligible basis, that would be you know, typically the cost of the asset that you're installing. This, you know, certainly when we're talking about a large scale project, we would want to understand that eligible basis from a cost segregation standpoint. So really breaking out those costs into their buckets and understanding does it fit within the technology and within the, the eligibility of the credit. There's opportunities too to perhaps boost that base of the tax credit as well by capitalizing additional cost to the base. And so perhaps for employees or employees that are supporting these projects, there might be a position to further capitalize those wage costs into the asset. And that would increase your credit. You know, if you have a higher basis, you, you would result in a higher credit. And then you would take that basis, you multiply it by the tax credit rate, which like I said, it's a sliding scale and it starts at 6%. And so 6% is your base rate. That's, you know, let's just say you put in a solar uh, solar panel and you didn't meet any of the additional credit adders, you would get 6% credit rate off of that. Now, let's say that you went above and beyond and you met a few other requirements. You know, one of the, the biggest jumps of a credit adder would be a prevailing wage or apprenticeship requirement adder. And so what this means is if your project was constructed by people who are paid a prevailing wage, and that's based on a certain geography, it's based on a skill set, and the, the mechanics and laborers who are constructing that project, if they're paid a prevailing wage, then the credit rate will jump from 6% to 30%. So it's a multiplier of five. It's a, you know, obviously a very large multiplier. And most of the organizations that we're currently working with are anticipating to meet those requirements. Now, I will touch on this in a little bit more detail, but it certainly is a brand new area within tax credits and in meeting prevailing wage. It's a new concept, but certainly the legislative intent was to help help create good paying jobs or ensure good paying jobs for, for building out the renewable energy transition. Other adders also include the domestic content adder. And so what this means is if you construct your project by using domestically sourced items, then you could get a 10% bump. So let's say that you're at 30%. And if you add another 10% on, that would make your total credit rate 40%. And Again, I'll touch on domestic content here in a little bit, those exact rules. And then finally, for the other two adders, they're more location-based adders. So if your projects are located in certain areas, then they could also draw incremental credit boost as well. Now you'll see the credit could range from 60 to 70%. And I'll say for most of the organizations that are on the call today, probably the maximum rate that could be expected would be around the 50% rate, maybe 60 you know, probably 50, if I had to say. And that's if all the stars align, right? These these extra credits, if you will, they're not just something that you easily fall into. It's certainly something that takes planning and effort, and it actually requires quite a bit of coordination. And so that is where I'm going to go into just a brief snapshot of some of those additional requirements. So like I said, prevailing wage is a new concept to tax credits, but it's actually not new from the standpoint of this concept has been around a Department of Labor concept from the Davis-Bacon Act that was passed. And really, like I said, it's just meant to, meant to ensure that the mechanics and laborers are paid a prevailing wage. Now, this is something that would apply not only to the contractors that perhaps you engage, but any subcontractors. And so, of course, setting up a system in place to make sure that people are paid that prevailing wage as time progresses. And if there were any underpayments, that those are corrected as soon as possible, because if these payments are not made on a timely basis, there could be penalties involved if you do try to claim the adder. So it's certainly prudent to make sure that you've got a foolproof system set up uh, that can catch any of these errors, as well as create a substantiation package that would you would want to have sit with you and with your tax team 
if ever there was a case of an audit. And so certainly this has been something that KPMG has been helping its clients out. That we have an advisory team that all they do day in and day out is consult on prevailing wages. And so certainly they are part of a bench of people that we pull together as we help our clients think about IRA credits. Now, if we go to domestic content here, domestic content being another adder and domestic content being that the structural steel that is used to create or used to construct the project needs to be 100% domestically sourced. And then only 40%, as of right now, only 40% of the domestic of manufactured product components need to be domestically sourced. Although you'll see the table on the right there does increase over time. So depending on when you begin construction on your project, domestic content and that requirement will gradually increase over time. So again, this is trying to account for let's construct our energy projects out of domestically sourced items. Now, of course, this is going to take a little bit of time. I mean, before the IRA, it was somewhere in the 90 percentile of how much of the, the components were being produced in China. And so certainly here in the U.S., there are manufacturing plants coming online right now and going to be coming online in the future. And so certainly that's why, you know, it's not a full 100 percent for manufactured product components, but the sliding scale to account for the fact that, you know, we're still trying to build out the supply chain here. All right, energy communities, I will quickly note on. So energy communities is an adder where you can add an extra 10 percent if you locate your project in a certain area. Those certain areas are, you know, one of them could be brownfields, which is more of a environmental protection agency or EPA designation. And then there's also designations made available to census tracts that are more heavily impacted by coal and oil and gas sort of jobs. And so looking at those census tracts and understanding if there's a uh, lower than average unemployment, and those census tracts were relying on those sort of coal and fossil fuel jobs, then if you locate your project there, you'll get a boost. And that, again, is trying to draw investments to areas where they're going to perhaps be more heavily hit by the transition from fossil fuel to, to renewable energy. All right. I'll quickly touch on, so those were some of the requirements that I wanted to mention to you all. There's a lot more to be had on those. I mean, each of those areas has, you know, a lot of specialties and subject matter expertise that's required. I mean, the domestic content analysis, for example, is something that our international tax trade and customs team has been working on for, for a number of years now. And so, again, they are a part of our team that we bring on board as we try to help our clients meet all of the different requirements. Now, I want to talk about two transferability. So, of course, you know, it's good to generate these these tax credits, but how do you monetize those? And so the transferability would allow for that. There is a process by which you would need to undertake to register with the IRS or Internal Revenue Service your project. And you would also need to identify the person that you are selling the tax credit to. Or in, on the flip side, you know, you might be purchasing a tax credit from somebody else. So understanding that as well and making sure that the appropriate procedures have been undertaken from an administrative standpoint, because if this process does not take place, then you will not be able to take advantage of the credit. Um, and so this transferability election has to be made on a timely and originally filed tax return. It cannot be made on an amended return. So that is certainly something really important to know is that you need to meet, meet this requirement. There's no relief on that point. And if you miss it, then it, you're just out. And of course, this transferability market, I mean, we're setting or seeing a brand new brokering or exchange of tax credits being established here in the U.S. Now, it's not anything like a stock exchange. There's a bunch of different players that are involved in this sort of market and KPMG being one of them. So our corporate finance team has also set up a brokering service by which they bring together buyers and sellers of these tax credits. 
And, and obviously, since this is still a nascent area, it's still developing. And so there's still, you know, it's still to be seen, you know, what, what sort of precedents or standards or guidelines we would anticipate, but certainly over time, the market is going to, to stabilize and there will be certain requirements that will just be standard as part of these transactions. You know, if I, you know, some of you may also be wondering too, well, I mentioned that you can sell these tax credits at a discount. Well, how much is that discount? It could range. It could range from, you know, 91 to 94 cents on the dollar, maybe even 96 cents on the dollar. So that's the general range. Of course, it depends on, you know, the type of technology that's part of that tax credit, the type of seller that you are. And so you'll see here on this next slide, the different sort of considerations that you could make in order to boost the cost or I should say boost the price that you could command for the tax credit that you sell. And so certainly going through all of the crossing the T or dotting the I's, crossing the T's in terms of all of these requirements and putting together that package of here's all my prevailing wage documentation, here's my domestic content documentation, and this is how we support our credit. You know, making sure that that is all available because the buyer of the credit will be very uh, they will want to have that information because at the end of the day, the buyer is the one who is responsible if there ever is an exam. And and so that is interesting, right? You know, talking about somebody who might have generated a credit, then sells it to somebody else and they still own the asset, the initial party. But then, you know, somebody else now technically has claim to the credit and they're the ones that would have to support this or defend it under exam. and. You would want to make sure that you have all that documentation in place from the seller and also ensure that you would have cooperation from them in that regard. All right. So giving you a little crash course here are the last slide that I'll leave you all with and then I'll talk about what's next. So there's been a lot that the IRS and Treasury, Internal Revenue Service and Treasury has been working on since the IRA has passed. I mean, you can see here that they have released a lot of guidance. So once the all of the statutes and the legislation came, came out, now the process of the proposed and final guidance is unrolling now. So you can see that they've certainly have been busy releasing guidance and there's still, still even more to be had here. So, what does that mean for, for organizations like you right now? You know, what's next here? Um, one, of, one of the questions probably that some of you are wondering about is the longevity of these credits. And so thinking about, you know, there's obviously here in 2024, this is an election year. And so there, there will be an administration change. We already know that. And uh, whether it's Kamala or, or Trump and we obviously know too that there have been um, statements made about how certain parties are not uh, do not like the clean energy tax credits, or some of them, I should say. You know, electric vehicles, for example, seems to be one that Republicans do not typically enjoy. And so there have been articles and statements put out where Republicans may want to pull back some of these credits. And certainly these credits, it's not just something that, you know, unilaterally could be pulled back without Congress. It has to be a, you know, sweeping pass in Congress in order to take away the credits. And if that were to happen, it would likely be something that's prospective and not retrospective. So when it go back in time, um, you know, it's hard to say. Right. And obviously the Democrats are generally supportive of clean energy tax credits. With that said, too, we do know that. Either party, no matter whichever party comes into the administration, um, in 2025, there will be a tax bill. We know that because many of the tax provisions that are currently ongoing, such as the, the corporate income tax rate of 21%, that'll be expiring in 2025. And we know that Republicans or Democrats are going to be putting together a bill and they are going to be looking for pay fors. So how to pay for, you know, certain things that they want to include in the bill. And so, you know, IRA being tax incentives certainly could be something that could draw eyes. 
Um, but like I said, it would take it would take the full approval of Congress in order to pass that. So I know I didn't give quite a, a clear answer one way or the other, but I wanted to give you a little bit of an insight into where we currently sit within the U.S. in terms of the credits. You know, another thing to think about, too, is that a lot of organizations that have been trying to tap. Yep. Should I uh, pass or stop here, Archer? Yep, so yep. I would say that, you know, continue to stay continue to stay up to date looking for guidance as it comes out. Look at your projects to see if they have any applicability for these tax credits and keep KPMG in mind as we can potentially help you with with accessing these credits. Thank you Candice for yes. a very interesting uh, presentation. We already have uh, two questions. Uh, in the chat, I will read them in the Q&A session. Okay, so now we come to our Q&A uh, session. Please use the chat function. Uh, I already saw two, at least two questions in the chat. So first is the, well, actually the two related to Candice, to your presentation. First, uh, the question is, do you have some examples for credits that were actually already sold. Yes, yep, there definitely have been credits that are, have already been sold. Absolutely. Yeah, and you can start selling the credits as soon as you place that asset into service and you can start uh, trying to find a buyer and you can uh, perhaps make a transaction before before the money actually comes through. And so or I should say from the tax credit itself. So certainly you could start on the transferability uh, road. Thank you. Then the second question also to you. Is there a, a time requirement for the subsidiaries? Which means do the one is requesting the credits have to be has to be incorporated in the US for a certain time already? Or can young companies just found it request the credits too? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yep. And so these credits are available to any U.S. taxpayer, if you will. So it could be a startup, it could be a well-established organization. You know, if it is a subsidiary, you would obviously want to work with the, the consolidated group as well to make sure that those filings, that you're all coordinated in terms of the filings that are being done. Uh, there are certain submissions that would need to be done. Uh, but yeah, certainly it's open to open to all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, maybe some more questions to come. Please use your chat uh, function. Um, in the meantime, uh, I will allow myself to ask the questions to you. Um, I mean, all this uh, stimulus packages that uh, has been already approved uh, and introduced some time ago. Now, what is the timeline in terms of, you know, how much has been used? I mean, is the, the train already left the station and we have to run after it or is still waiting and can still use some of these packages you already mentioned for the IRA, there will be the new bill, um, tax bill um, mm -hmm. approval in 25. Uh, what about the others? Uh, what is the situation there of the market? Yeah, I'm happy to weigh in there. So. With these tax credits, you know, there's certainly a certain eligibility dates and a lot of these credits, I mean, it, they have, I shouldn't say all of them, but some of them have a 10 year span. And so going to 2032, some of them do. Um, now, with that said, obviously, that the eligibility rules do somewhat vary throughout the years. And so obviously you need to make sure that you're you're understanding what rules are applicable to you based on when you begin construction on your project, based on when you place it into service, but um, those are still out there. With the grant side of things, I know grants, they certainly have been, uh, there's been a lot of opportunity, funding opportunity announcements that have been released, and a lot of the funding has, or has been allocated or is going to be allocated. I do think there is some left, though, on the grant side. Um, but certainly, I think the tax credits has a little bit more of a, a long tail, if you will. So for those of you that perhaps haven't gotten up to speed on it, there's more time for you to still take a look, especially on the tax credit side. Okay, thank you. So any other questions from the audience? There are still 
chat is open, so please write your questions in the chat. And we'll wait another couple of minutes to maybe the questions will come up to your mind. Well, it doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, then uh, let's go to the, oh, there is a, one question. Is there a possibility for companies not or co not incorporated in the US to apply? You, yeah, that's a good question. Um, you will need some sort of, you know, US entity or EIN um, identification number. And so maybe, yeah, and I guess th that's a good question because the other thing that leads to this is if there is activity, because a lot of these tax credits are U.S. based. And so if you're already spending money or, you know, doing these sort of applications in the U.S., it it would be presumed that you already would have a tax liability that would be owed on a federal basis. Um, so it's almost like they go hand in hand. But yeah, in terms of going to make the application, you would want to make sure that you have a, a U.S. entity, EIN, um, and what have you. Okay, it seems the questions are coming now. <laughs> uh, do you have in the U.S. a similar tax credit mechanism for R&D software development as in Canada? Yeah, so the U.S., <clears throat> we do have an R&D tax credit. It's a little bit similar to, to Canadians' R&D or shred claim. Um, it is, it's a tax credit that is not typically not refundable. So you generally need to have a federal income tax liability to use it, but you could carry back credits one year for 20 years. It could be refundable to some eligible startup businesses, though, so refundable against payroll taxes. But yes, R&D tax credits are available and they've been around since the 80s. And not just on a federal scale, but also many U.S. states also offer their own form of a tax credit that you could layer in on top of the federal. The rules between the U.S. and Canada are, are a little bit different. Um, by my premonition or my perspective is that the U.S. is a little bit more, um, more activities can qualify as R&D as compared to the Canadian program if we're trying to compare the two. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, next uh, question, Swiss companies can, can get an EIN, can they apply? I'm yep. not sure whether this is can or cannot, yes. uh, but... <laughs> yep, yep, they definitely can. Okay, yep. good. Next question, how can I determine if the extra 10% for the energy community can be applied? That's another really good question. So the Department of Energy put out a mapping tool that you can use. I didn't include a link in this presentation, but it, even if you look it up online or Google it, you would be able to find that there's a mapping tool that you can use. Now, it only has the, the census tracts that are impacted by fossil fuel um, and have low unemployment. It doesn't have the brown fields. So the brown fields you'd have to look up separately under EPA, but yeah, that would be where I would first start don't use it as an end-all be-all though, because I actually have run into instances where it wasn't correct. So it's always good to look at the underlying census tracts to make sure they actually are qualified. Okay, maybe uh, the question is, maybe you could share this link uh, in the yes. chat. Yep. Okay, Definitely thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, it doesn't seem to be the case anymore. So thank you very much. It was my pleasure to guide you through this uh, presentation, through this uh, webinar. I hope it was uh, useful for you. Uh, so thank you for your participation. Thank you all the speakers. Maybe last word from each of you at the end. Uh, Roger, shall you start? Yes, I thank uh, everybody who was um, <clears throat> attending the, the webinar today and uh, it was interesting to have all these information. So thanks a lot to the participants and to the speakers and possibly we will 
organize a follow-up call in the next uh, few months. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Candice? Yes, uh, thank you so much for having me. And if you all have any questions for any tax credit needs, definitely, or grants or incentives, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you, Candice. Melanie? Yes, thank you also from my side. And please do reach out if you have questions um, about uh, our offering or if you need uh, a bank helping you in the US. OK, thank you all of you. Thank you also uh, our hidden champion, Sabine, who was in the background uh, controlling all the webinar. Um, so I hope to see you in one of our future events from uh, SG or from uh, Swiss Business Hub USA. We are here for you, so uh, please do not hesitate to contact us directly. And in the, with this, I would like to close this webinar. I uh, wish you all a pleasant evening on the good day and uh, see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>